It's my great pleasure to introduce um, Yuki Hino and Catherine Mock, both climate scientists at Stanford. Uh, between them, they have decades of experience working on climate change, its impacts to our economies and our communities. Uh, so help me welcome them here tonight. So it seems somewhat fitting that we all walked here through clouds of ash tonight because we're here to talk about uh, extreme, cl extreme weather events, climate change, and what we can do about it. Just in the last few months, we've seen hurricanes devastate Puerto Rico and islands across the Caribbean, Florida, and Texas. We've seen heat waves and record-setting temperatures across the globe, um, a heat wave in, uh, in Europe called Lucifer, um, even now fires in our own neighborhood and all across the West have been blazing and, and leaving our skies full of ash. So it's starting to feel a little bit like the end of days, um, but this is not necessarily a time for um, throwing up our hands. There's a lot we can do, and so tonight we're here to talk about what it is we can do to prepare and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, so Catherine, what, what do we actually know about how climate change is in, related to and what role it plays in the recent uh, extreme events and, and what, we, what we know about how it might change going forward. Thanks, Kate. And I agree with you that in many ways it is a sobering moment to think about that question. But that said, I'm going to zoom way out and mm -hmm. think about what we know about how climate change is shaping the risks of extremes today. We've understood the basic physics of how our emissions of heat-trapping gases function as a little blanket over the surface of the Earth and keep more energy in. We've understood those physics for over a century, and we now have decades of evidence in real time in terms of how the consequences are unfolding. Not only the unequivocal warming, but how that is translating into widespread and consequential impacts on all continents. And when we think about those impacts, it's really extremes that in many ways are the sharp end of the climate system. And that's the case, whether it's heat waves, heavy rain, or coastal flooding, or as we've been thinking about this summer, Harvey, Irma, Jose, Maria, Nate, Ophelia, monsoon flooding on the other side of the planet, or wildfires, first in the Pacific Northwest and now here in California. Climate change drives up the odds of those extremes. When we think about cyclones, it's the way a warmer ocean makes storms more powerful. It's the way a warmer atmosphere can hold more water so that more comes crashing down when it rains. It's the way that storm surge strikes on top of sea level rise. Wildfires might be even more complex than cyclones, but we also have very clear understanding that our emissions of heat trapping gases have driven up fire risk in the American West. That's in terms of how many fires are burning for how long, how big the area burned is in total. These are complex occurrences related to how much fuel is on the ground, how dried out it is, and whether ignition happens. But across all of those different aspects, a warmer, drier atmosphere drives up the risks. And the last thing I'll mention is that in terms of the science of how we understand the relationship between climate change and extremes, increasingly that's something we can look at event by event. So we know almost for sure that there will be many different studies of all these different cyclones, fire risk in specific instances, not just in general. So it sounds like there are a, a wide range of different risks um, that are facing people all over the world and the enormity of those risks um, can be daunting, but is there anything that we can do about what are the types of things that we can do to understand, prepare for, and mitigate those risks? Miyuki? So I guess the good news is there's tons we can do um, to reduce the risk from climate change. So the f there's really two components to this. And the first component is reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit. Um, that's going to reduce the amount of sea level rise we ultimately see. It's going to reduce the temperature increases that we see. And so that's going to take really ambitious effort on all of our parts to reduce emissions from our transportation, from our electricity, and so forth. The second really big part of dealing with climate change is adaptation, preparing for the wildfires, the floods, building resilience and being prepared for when those changes happen. It's not if these changes are going to happen, it's how and it's when. And so we really need to come to terms with the fact that these changes are in the pipeline, they're on our way, and it's up to us to prepare for them. I think one stumbling block that we often see with dealing with climate change is people saying, we don't know how much sea level rise is going to happen, so how do we prepare for it? Or we don't know what the temperatures are going to be, how do we prepare for it? We make decisions under uncertainty all the time. right? We, uh, I have no idea 
what the odds are that the stock market is going to crash tomorrow, but I have a very small amount of retirement savings invested in the stock market right now. So I think thinking about this in terms of risk management and doing everything we can, um, both on the emissions reducing side and the preparation side to minimize those risks is um, what's key. The other side of this is that, especially in terms of adaptation, there's lots of stuff we would do, we, would, we can do for climate change that we would want to do anyway. Um, so one great example of this is urban parks, right? We have a fantastic urban parks system in San Francisco. And it turns out that urban parks store rainwater, they store carbon, uh, they also improve air quality, and that's great, but I'd want urban parks around even if they didn't do all of those things. So when it comes down to it, adaptation is really, it looks a lot like building a better world. It's investing in strong, healthy communities, robust infrastructure, and healthy ecosystems. It, it's starting to seem like there are no safe places. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and I thought that might be a nice place to be if it starts getting warmer. Um, but now there are fires and, and flooding. And um, so are there, are there places that are more at risk than others or communities that are more um, at risk than others? Uh, the wildfires in California um, just now destroying uh, beautiful wineries, but also trailer parks. Is this going to be a, a leveler of, of um, across communities and, and, and economic ranges, or is this something that um, more heavily impacts different communities? Climate happens everywhere, and that pretty much means that climate change also happens everywhere. But when we think about what's at risk in a changing climate, I think it's really important to recognize that the risks in the changing climate aren't all just about the climate. It's really how climate intersects with people and nature. It's about how different hazards intersect with what is vulnerable and what's exposed, what's in harm's way. So that means whether we think about the flooding that's happened in Houston this past uh, months or India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, where you have people living in floodplains, that's really what constructs risk and what gives us that potential for damage. If you look at different places, those damages are really different. Writ large, if you're in a developed country, the monetary impacts will be much larger than in developing countries and the lives lost cut the other way. I think a really key point is that there's no one way to measure what's at risk in a changing climate. Different people put legitimate emphasis on us today versus our uh, kids into the future. They care to different degrees what happens to the rich versus the poor, or nature versus economies. And that means that there are many different ways to say, here's what is most important in shaping society's attention of what we need to respond. So we can say there's some systems that are incredibly at risk right now. The Great Barrier Reef, coral reefs around the system, around the world, see substantial impacts now, and those goes up rapidly in the near term. Extremes that we're talking about today are always on the burner, and they're becoming more intense. But there's also an unfairness factor around that, whether you're looking within a city or within a country, or across countries, there are people who are more affected when anything happens, whether that's a heat wave, a flood, or the failure of a crop. And there's some things that add up in total. Once the economic damages get to the point where the government as the insurer of last resort no longer can handle it, suddenly society at large might care. But I think the powerful thing is that in some ways, because climate change is something that happens everywhere, it's something that unifies us in terms of learning about how to respond and what we can do to build that better world. Let's talk more about building that better world. What, what are the types of things, you started to explain, Miyuki, what the types of um, things you might do to better adapt or build resilience. Who, who, who's responsible for doing that? Is that each of us? Is that uh, only local governments, federal government? Who else can be involved in, in making those um, changes today? Adaptation is really neat because everyone at all scales has a, has a role to play. Um, at the individual and household and neighborhood level, um, we see a, a lot of really, really important contributions to resilience. Um, for one example, uh, in Chicago in 1995, there was a, a deadly heat wave. Hundreds, hundreds of people um, were killed by the heat. And when they went back and looked at what made some people more vulnerable to the heat than others, it wasn't just the poor neighborhoods, it wasn't just the minorities there were actually some neighborhoods where everyone was okay because the social networks were so strong, because people knew where elderly people lived alone and they knew to go check on them. 
Um, they knew who to go to for help. And so those types of things you might not think of as resilience, but in truth, they make a big contribution. Zooming up to higher scales, uh, I think we've seen really fantastic city leadership when it comes to adaptation. Um, San Francisco actually right now is in the middle of a resilience by design competition where they're bringing together architects, engineers, ecologists, and trying to come up with adaptation measures that help deal with sea level rise, but also provide tons of other social benefits, um, creating new parks, uh, creating new areas for recreation. We're also uh, at the city and higher level, we're being creative about being flexible with our investments. You know, we don't know exactly how much sea level rise is coming our way. So why don't we build a levy that's got a really wide foundation so that when we know more about how much sea level rise is coming, we can make it higher if we need to. And that type of innovative thinking we're starting to see as well. Um, I shouldn't leave out the private sector. So we're also seeing um, movement in the private sector as well. The insurance and the reinsurance industries, of course, are, are very on top of this. They see the signals. They know what's coming. And their models are top-notch uh, top risk models. And we're also seeing more demand from shareholders to understand what the risks are from climate change to the companies that they um, own. So I think at all these different levels, we're seeing actors joining the adaptation circle and trying to contribute to resilience in these different ways. If uh, the insurers know that these risks is it exist and there are communities that are actively working to start to build up those, that resilience, why isn't this happening at a larger scale? Why aren't we hearing about this happening everywhere? Why, why wasn't Puerto Rico and, and Houston and others, why weren't they prepared for the types of events that we've seen over the course of the last few months? A few points to make. So one would be that there is adaptation happening everywhere, every continent, private and public sector. But the big asterisk on that statement would be that almost all adaptation that's happened to date is kind of at stage one, and it's been somewhat stuck there. So we're doing a lot of risk and vulnerability assessment. We know what uh, transportation networks, which roads, which health systems are most affected when disasters unfold. We're doing a lot of planning. California, for example, is a major leader in this domain with this massive 200-page draft report out right now going agency by agency, region by region, thinking about what this means for the state to become more prepared. But in terms of adaptation experiences to date, it kind of stops there for the most part. We are just starting to actually take action. And we are really just starting to figure out when we take action, is it effective? So we're at stage one, but it kind of... Um, present some questions about why is it been harder to get to stage two, so to speak. So the second point I'll make is that adaptation is a social process. It's really easy to make a model where you say, for this little bit of shoreline, we'll put a barrier up, and then over here we'll have people retreat, and you can do a little dotted uh, coastal risk management plan around the US, and it actually looks pretty cheap, but it's not easy to implement. Implementing means coming through the social process of government and figuring out how to get political will to align, how to do undo a lot of different incentives that we have uh, relied on historically. And so in terms of the increasing understanding of what are the major constraints, one that gets pointed to a lot is where's the money coming from? How do you finance adaptation? That's really challenging when you're in a low-income country context. And what we've seen very creatively and powerfully there is something called climate resilient development, recognizing that development is inextricably linked to adaptation because, as Miyuki described, adaptation is linked to everything we do. So oftentimes, if you're going to put in a road or a bridge, you can climate proof it. And that climate proofing is actually pretty cheap compared to the cost of the entire investment, but it makes you much more resilient into the future. There's also increasing understanding that risk perception matters. We all think we're perfectly rational, but it doesn't always work out that way. So for example, after a disaster happens, we're much more likely to overestimate the likelihood of that disaster happening until we forget about it. And then we're definitely not worried, and we're very happy to let all the smart things we put into place slowly unwind. That goes for us as citizens, and it also goes for our elected leaders. So the third constraint I'll mention is political will, coordinating governance systems so they can navigate laws and regulations and recognizing that development as incentives are all about property taxes in many cases, so you want to build, or you get things like the levy effect, so once you put protection in place, now people build right up behind that and they through our systems of governance, we'll want to continue to live there, 
political will is incredibly important for navigating these very complex aspects of laws coming together with regulations and culture and psychology. Just a follow-up question. Do most communities or um, uh, officials or, or, or corporate leaders, do they have the information they need to know about what climate change might mean for the risks that they're facing? How is that information readily available? And if so, what, what are the sources of those information that are reliable? So here in California, we have uh, incredible access to real-time information for sea level rise. Not only do we have the sea level rise scenarios that have been developed through global assessment and national assessment through NOAA, but we even have our California-specific sea level rise scenarios. But I think the point Miyuki made around the fact that the challenge is not necessarily the availability of information, it's figuring out what do you do with the fact that the upper bound for sea level rise in the US in year 2100 is 10 feet. If that were to happen, honestly, we have no idea exactly how we would prepare for it or what the impacts would be or to what degree could we really make things happen rapidly. But it's really hard to say up until that range of very large amounts of sea level rise, what are the odds? And being completely rational in the face of that uncertainty in many ways is oftentimes the bigger challenge of information as compared to just its availability. So when we talk about um, 2100, a lot of climate models are you know, go out that far. We, we know uh, we have some understanding of what might happen in that time frame. Um, what is sort of a long-term view on what we need to do to adapt to the changes that we expect over the lifetime of um, our children uh, looking forward of, of long-lived infrastructure? How do we start to look forward to some, making some of those long-term decisions? I think it is going to get tougher. We are going to get pushed farther and farther out of our comfort zone. And there's no question that the smaller sort of tweaking around the edges that we uh, can do now, that might not work with 10 feet of sea level rise um, or comparable changes in temperature. So there are a couple of, there are, I think a couple of areas where we're already coming towards those tipping points and already coming to a place where we're making really tough choices about things that are going to um, you know, be in place 50 years down the line. So one of those, one great example of that is our coastlines. Um, we have developed our coasts as if sea level was stationary, and it's not. So it's a really tough process now for us to come to terms with the fact that it's going to be a moving shoreline for hundreds of years into the future, and we have to respond to that in some way. In some places, it'll make sense for us to invest billions and billions of dollars in holding that line. Um, in lower Manhattan, uh, in Miami, for instance, it probably is going to make sense financially to spend billions on a flood wall. In a lot of places, though, that won't make sense. And so what we have to start thinking about is what do we do in those places? California has actually really, you probably won't be surprised, but has really been a pioneer in thinking about this stuff. Um, so there are a couple of places already on the California coast where Highway 1 is being relocated inland instead of just being rebuilt where it is now, because it's ultimately going to save all of us money as taxpayers, spending money to rebuild it over and over again. We haven't, uh, in California, those, those infrastructure moves haven't affected houses and people yet. Um, but we're doing that too. And so recently, the federal government awarded money to a community in southern Louisiana to actually relocate them completely um, away from an island that had been eroding really, really rapidly um, and farther north into a place that's going to be safe. So that's one area where I think these rethinking our coastlines is going to be uh, hugely important for decades into the future. Uh, the other tipping point I think we're at is um, something that Catherine mentioned earlier around the local governments pushing development, pushing development, pushing development, and then disasters hitting, and the federal government being the one to kind of step in and cover a lot of the disaster costs. Um, we have the National Flood Insurance Program now that's uh, tens of billions of dollars in debt. It hasn't recovered since Katrina in 2005. And um, you know, Congress is thinking really, really hard about how to restore the fiscal responsibility and the fiscal balance with that system um, without putting too much pressure on low-income homeowners and local governments who really rely on those property taxes. 
So we're coming up on some of these structural changes. Um, and I think, I think at this point, I would characterize it as we're, we're dipping our toes in the water. We're learning from it. And we're really at the start of this process. So all the lessons that we pick up from these early experiences are going to be really important going forward. Um, when you talk about um, islands in Louisiana being relocated, the, some of these, um, these same concerns and challenges have come up with island nations uh, outside of the US. Um, what are some of the conversations that have been happening about um, the future of those, of, of those places and those people? That's a really tough question. <laughs> um, and that's where adaptation, I think, um, really comes up into the level of international governance and international cooperation. Uh, what does it mean to be a citizen of a country if the country doesn't have territory anymore? Um, I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, there are certainly people thinking about it and people working on it, um, but it comes as no surprise that those small island states are the most vocal proponents of really aggressive emission reduction in the near term. And uh, for them, it's it's a matter of their culture and their nation sustaining and living on for hundreds of years. And I think um, we would prefer not to cross that bridge. Um, but I, I think that the international community will have to come together um, and create a solution if that time comes. Um, Catherine, what, what are the sorts of things that um, we all should be doing to make sure that um, the communities that we live in, um, the, the people that we work with are starting to incorporate um, better understanding of climate change and its impacts and, and what they can do about it. So if Miyuki highlighted all of the really hard stuff, the stuff that requires deliberate attention to the long term in a way that we are not very good at doing. I'll take the flip side. Uh, there are many entry points to adaptation that are very much about win-wins and solutions that make sense almost absent their benefits related to climate change. So first, how do we live uh, in terms of our families and our homes and our communities? There's a lot of emphasis in the adaptation space that adaptation is place specific. Oftentimes people say adaptation is local and then scientists will come back and they're a little bit dweeby, but they'll say no, it's global in that it is local, but it importantly picks up threads that span through state level government, national government, and even the international community as a whole. So what does that mean? Adaptation is something that happens at the family level, whether you're in a flood a prone area and you elevate your power outlets in your home, or whether you're in an area prone to heat waves and you make sure you have heat uh, air conditioning or access to cooling centers. No matter where you are, when disaster strikes, do you know what your emergency plan is and where you would evacuate? Those are things that I think all of us have probably been sitting at home saying, do I have an earthquake kit? As we've been thinking about everything happening throughout uh, the nation or here in California now with the wildfires unfolding. Muki also emphasized the degree to which adaptation is about building communities that we like to live in. Can our infrastructure resist? Do we have great communities that check on the most vulnerable when a heat wave happens or when a wildfire strikes? Are our cities walkable? Do we have those parks that can sop up water at the same time that they provide all of those other benefits? So how we live would be the first category of win-win, no-da, really good stuff in the adaptation space. Number two would be how do we unleash the markets? We as consumers have a lot of ability to request that companies disclose their risks, both in terms of what is called CO2 risk, so are they dependent on fossil fuels in really profound ways, but also in terms of their climate risks. And in terms of the climate risks, adaptation oftentimes makes a lot of sense from the bottom line from a company perspective. First of all, there can be vulnerability of assets that are directly exposed to coastal flooding. But there can also be vulnerability of supply chains that extend around the globe. So monsoon flooding across uh, the globe can affect your ability to, as a company, have all the parts you need in your products. But we can also unleash the markets in terms of how they help internalize risk in a rational way. So things like insurance or rational resource pricing, pricing or risk pools all help us make better decisions in a changing climate, even though they tap the power of the market there. Granted all the caveats about our national flood insurance that we can dive into in even greater depth. The last thing that is very accessible to everyone is how we vote and shape our local politics. 
Local government, as well as the private sector, are increasingly recognized as absolutely critical to making adaptation happen. Here in California, for example, we have zoning that's right along the coast, but in some really interesting ways, it's tied to the coast, uh, the whole coastal counties zoning, and that is in turn linked to what happens at the state level through the Coastal Commission. So those types of interconnections come down to local politics in many different cases, both in terms of how we're syncing up things in really creative ways. When we uh, put into place new regulations, are we making sure they can adjust through time? All of those things are new, but they have a lot of traction at the local level. And once we figure it out at the local level, oftentimes it's easier to make it scale. Can you guys talk a little bit more about um, how we manage risk in other contexts and, and whether um, those experiences help us to, to look at climate change? I'm thinking about the types of timeframes um, that a lot of corporate entities and investors look at in terms of their return on investment is, is a lot shorter time frame than maybe uh, you might consider some of the long-term climate risks. How, how do we think about risk in other contexts and how um, is that working for the way that we think about climate risks and, and, and how might we better incorporate um, some of those unique challenges to climate change in, in thinking about risk? I'll, I'll give that one a go. Um, risk is tough. Um, we have this fantastic ab ability to put it at the back of our minds and not realize that um, it's really there. So I study flooding and I think um, I've had dozens of people come up to me and tell me their flooding story. Um, whether it was their house or their uncle's house or their grandparents' house. I've only ever had one person come up to me and say, I thought about buying a house on the beach, and then I thought twice. And so we don't, we don't tend to put this as one of our top concerns, even when we are making big financial investments. And I think the role of insurance there in making us face the music in terms of putting a dollar price on the amount of risk that we're taking on is really critical. Um, and for, we know it's tough. I mean, look, just look at health insurance. We know it's really hard to find uh, insurance schemes that are equitable, that meet all of our social goals, but are also fiscally responsible. Um, but that's exactly the same kind of balance that we're trying to find with the flood insurance program right now. And I think those, the more we can come to those solutions, the more that we are forced to confront risk on a regular basis and then internalize those into our long-term decisions. Give two more examples that uh, flush out the space. So how many people in this room feel very comfortable buckling their seatbelts? How many people here have fire insurance? Those are all risk measures we take, but I think as an interesting twist, we're also required to have fire insurance and buckle our seatbelts. So that intersection between what makes sense and what are our social choices as a society about what we require intersects in really fascinating ways. One more uh, area where there is incredibly sophisticated focus on risk is the security space. And I think it actually draws a lot of interesting parallels to what we need to be doing more of when we think about climate change. So security on the international stage, whether it's the potential for war between states or war within countries, is inherently unpredictable. And so that means that in terms of scenario planning in the security space, you're not trying to calculate your most likely outcome. You're thinking about vulnerabilities and risk points in a way that is imagining possible futures that might happen and then stress testing everything backwards from there. In the climate space, we've spent a whole lot of time fixating on really trying to say what temperature increase is most likely to happen, what amount of sea level rise is most likely to happen. And we're just starting to pull in some of these methods that are grappling with the fact that a lot of these odds we can't put precise numbers on, but we can start to think about where will we fail in terms of basic goals we as people have. I'll add one thing to that, which is that one group that I left off when I was talking about all the different actors in the adaptation space is the military. Um, and in the US, the military has, has been one of the leading actors in terms of embracing the threat that especially sea level rise um, poses to them achieving their missions. And um, the naval bases, especially in the US, have produced a lot of the information that the surrounding communities rely on to do their vulnerability assessment and their vulnerability planning. And they have this perspective of what's the worst case scenario? You know, where are we most likely to encounter something that's going to make us fail in our mission? Um, and that attitude, I think, enables you to take on climate change in a very different way than fixating on what the number that we have to plan for is.
The military example is one um, that also raises another point that um, is interesting. I think that um, the military has also been looking at other ways to be resilient um, to uh, climate change, but in, in other risks as well. And those are the types of things like having renewable fuels um, and um, renewable electricity. Um, those are also things that help us avoid uh, the emissions that cause climate change. So a lot of d do a lot of adaptation actions end up being things that are also positive um, in terms of mitigating emissions of, of greenhouse gases. I like to think about adaptation and mitigation, where mitigation is reducing our emissions in the first place, adaptation is preparing for everything that's left as being inextricably linked. At the big picture, you can say that they are linked because even if we are as ambitious as we possibly can be, <laughs> at whatever scale, and reining in our emissions of heat trapping gases, we have warming in the pipeline that we will need to prepare for. So for both of them, it's not a question of if, but when and how do we put them together. So in terms of putting the pieces together, I think it interestingly ties back to the local scale in many cases, where if you have a walkable city with <coughs> great transport and people can get around easily, oftentimes that attention to infrastructure has adaptation co-benefits at the same time that it can reduce emissions. Also in the private sector, Space. We see companies increasingly putting those two together, as we mentioned before, for CO2 risk plus climate risk. Those are kind of the two sides of that equation. Going green in terms of clean energy, building storage for servers, for example, at the same time that companies are thinking about the vulnerability of those supply chains. So at almost any scale of government or any type of actor, there are really natural ways they come together, even if they're looking at different sides of the risk equation. And in the places across the world that have done the best at um, planning and, and, and building resilience, what are the attributes of those places that you think helped them do that? Was it, as you mentioned, something that was a requirement, like seatbelts, people only uh, took those actions once it was required by a government? Or was it, did the genesis come from somewhere else? Uh, one example that I come back to a lot um, is the Netherlands, because um, they've been dealing with flooding for, for many, many centuries now. And what I find so fascinating about their uh, risk management system is that it's really a culturally rooted risk management system. Um, several Dutch people that I have met can tell me exactly how many feet above sea level their hometown is. I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you that about where I live now. Um, and so this cultural awareness of this is how high my house is, this is where the levee is, and this is where I'm going to go if it floods, is something that we simply, it's, it's not sort of inculcated in us when we were born. And that's a very hard thing to change. But I do think that um, there's, a, there's a really strong cultural dimension of embracing this challenge as a group, as a country, and being willing to, to spend a lot of resources on this problem. Um, to achieve communal goals um, that I think is, is really tough to replicate, but seems to foster the political will that's so key to driving adaptation forward. So I've got some questions from the audience. Um, given that climate change is happening, what are the most cost-effective policies and private sector actions we as the US should take to mitigate the impact? There are many actions in response to climate change, both in terms of reducing emissions, but also in preparing for impacts that unambiguously save money. So one of the big pillars of climate action in the US has been increasing the efficiency of our vehicles, our appliances, our buildings. All of those things mean that your electricity bill is small, smaller, that you don't have to fill up at the pump as often. All of those save money at the same time that they have a big potential for reducing the amount of energy we need. Same goes for climate change impacts. Last year in the US, there were 15 weather and climate related events that caused a billion dollars of damages each. This year, in terms of total damages, we're likely to completely blow last year out of the water in terms of the cyclones and the wildfires. Those are massive damages. And as Muki emphasized, when the government, national government in particular, is the insurer of last resort, that is a very large tab to pull. So being more prepared oftentimes requires a lot of smart ambition proactively, but it gives you a big uh, boost in terms of your resilience when disaster strikes. What are your thoughts about Governor Brown's diplomatic trips to China? Do you believe China can regulate itself? What efforts do you see China taking um, to combat climate change? Um, I think that 
one of the really powerful drivers that has changed China's attitude towards climate change uh, policy is their air quality and the struggles that they have internally um, with managing air pollution, um, especially in their big cities. And I think that it seems to me that they have come around and realized that even if we don't care about climate change at all, even if we just think about the health of our citizens, it makes a lot of sense for us to shut down a lot of coal plants. In that sense, I think that um, Governor Brown's leadership internationally demonstrating that there are many committed citizens in the US to tackling climate change with a lot of ambition is really important. And it's important to keep the US in some shape or form at the global table, um, especially as more and more countries realize it's in their own self-interest to step up. The Kyoto Protocol in 1997, there is a really big divide between developed and developing countries that was deeply embedded in terms of the requirements. If you jump forward to the Paris Agreement, which is the, the next major international treaty to come along in the climate space, we have a radically different picture. And you could almost tie that back to November of 2014, when the US and China came together, essentially the two biggest emitters in the world, holding hands symbolically, giving joint pledges on the climate stage. In some ways, that act, the fact that the US and China, two biggest emitters spanning that develop, developing country divide, came forward together with their country pledges of what they would do. And actually, the rate of change required in China's pledge is higher than the rate of change required in the US's pledge in many ways. That enabled the Paris Agreement to happen. It may not have happened otherwise in that same way. And every other country followed in step. So I think stepping forward to the current moment and the election that happened recently and the negotiations that happened just the, uh, the week and two after, the real question was, will China stay the course? And I think, as Miyuki emphasized, there's reasons for them to do that, both in terms of air quality and health, but also they're creating unbelievable economic opportunities and changing the way the world works. They realize that that's an opportunity to step up. And I think in terms of Governor Brown, we've seen profound subnational leadership saying, even if the national government slows again and again and again and again, there's a ton of action that still can happen and add up in really important ways. And in, in particular, because China is one of the leading markets for, in particular for vehicles, their announcement recently that they're planning to phase out uh, fossil fuel vehicles and, and, and um, only allow electric vehicles on their roads in the next, uh, in the coming decades is a, is a big sign that they're, they're pushing forward in that direction in the same way that, that California has been. Um, another question from the audience uh, related to the, the Paris Agreement. Um, some detractors have attacked the, the Paris Accord as either inadequate, unfeasible, or too expensive. Um, what is your take? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the Paris Agreement is an opt-in agreement. And there are a lot of questions of what does that mean? Uh, and there are a lot of ways the dialogue has getting, gotten a little bit off track. So in terms of thinking about how the Paris Agreement works, key thing is every country comes forward with their pledge of what they're going to do. And then there is peer pressure attention to that pledge. So we can look at all the pledges. We can add them up. We can see how well that does compared to these incredibly ambitious goals embedded in the agreement of keeping warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. So this is an opt-in peer pressure system where you put forward your first pledge. And then every five years from now until indefinitely, countries revise those pledges and crank up their ambition through time. I think what's really interesting is that in most places that have begun to decarbonize, economies actually have been going up. They are not going down. So there are many ways that innovation actually unleashes market opportunities, creates healthy air and uh, opportunities for infrastructure we're putting into place in ways that actually have boosted economies, not vice versa. A lot of people talk about the emission reduction commitments as a part of Paris, but are there um, elements of the Paris Agreement that um, speak to adaptation and resilience? Are, are there, is there hope that the, that agreement will also move forward efforts uh, in, that, in that space? I think that was a really challenging part of the international agreement because developing countries are in a position where they haven't had the benefit of emitting from coal and natural gas for decades, centuries even, uh, that countries like the US and the UK have had. Um, yet they are the ones that are going to be hit hardest by climate change. Um, so that component, the equity component of the Paris Agreement, um, I think was a really tough 
balance beam to walk, really. Um, but we are seeing funds flow from developed countries to developing countries. Um, the Green Climate Fund um, is part of one big part of that international climate governing system. And we're starting to see money both get committed to it and both get out and dispersed into projects um, in developing countries to help them cope with the effects of climate change. But I expect that it'll be something that comes back again and again in the future. And although the long-term temperature goal gets all the attention, keeping warming well below two degrees Celsius, we also have a global adaptation goal. It's a little bit more abstract. It's something like increasing resilience, increasing adaptive capacity, and reducing vulnerability. And I think the level of abstractness there is actually a really important indicator of the fact that we're at stage one with adaptation. And the next whole uh, set of actions to come is figuring out what does that mean in terms of goals that are really concrete at the global scale, at the country scale? How do we actually figure out if societies overall are becoming more prepared for impacts? And how do we say that, not just at the national scale, but project by project? Um, so this is a, a question about oceans. And how well does the science, how well do we understand the science behind what's happening in the oceans and the risk um, involved in climate change affiliated with, with, with oceans? Oceans cover 70% of the land, the Earth's surface, and they actually take up about 90% of the heat that comes into the climate system. So we usually fixate on the atmosphere and the global mean temperature increase right at the surface of the planet, but most of the heat that we are injecting into our climate is ending up in the water. You can simplistically say that in a changing climate, the oceans are becoming not just hot, but also sour they're becoming more acidic and breathless. Uh, they're losing oxygen due to not just the, the heating up, but also the changes in uh, stratification across the ocean layers. There are many different impacts from all of those changes, ranging from bleaching for coral reefs, some of the most exposed, vulnerable, highly biodiverse systems where we're seeing profound impacts already, and where the options are there, but they are limited, and it's really hard to get around that fact. Through to the way that we see fisheries shifting in terms of where fish are on a yearly basis, and how that can play out quite profoundly for people, especially in tropical waters, who not just depend on fishing for their livelihoods, but also in terms of how they feed their families. I'll add just that from a sea level rise perspective, um, the science is still progressing really quickly. We have a pretty good handle on uh, melting glaciers, for instance, but we have much less understanding of what's happening in Antarctica. And so a lot of the uncertainty you see in those projections, uh, especially when we get out to the end of the century, come from the fact that we're still learning about the way that ice sheets are moving, melting, and being affected by uh, climate change. So we've been talking about um, near-term weather extremes, um, but there are other major um, changes, tipping points um, in particular, including um, the ice sheets. What are, the, what are those types of um, potential um, climate disasters that are, that are more long-term that we should be thinking about? And, how, and what is our understanding of how that may play into our long-term planning for the potential risks of, of climate change? I think on the sea level rise front, it's really sobering, but what Catherine said earlier is true. If, if we found out tomorrow that the West Antarctic ice sheet collapsed and we were in for five extra feet of sea level rise in the matter of decades, I am honestly not sure what we would do. Um, realistically, uh, we would have to r dramatically change our planning processes to make things go faster right now. Um, it takes about 10 years to, uh, for the Army Corps to put a plan together for a project on the coast. So that involves the local government applying, uh, submitting a proposal for funding for a feasibility study. So they have to get funding for the feasibility study. That takes a little while. Then they have to complete the feasibility study, which takes on the order of five years. Um, and then they have to uh, try to actually get funding for whatever it is that the feasibility study comes up with. Um, and that actually sometimes is a, doesn't end because Congress has to authorize each of these projects one by one. And so the time that it takes for us to really respond to changes in the, um, in the climate system is huge. We have a huge time, um, build up time that we need. Um, 
So in some sense, uh, that's one of those things that, that we have to think about changing in the way that we permit these projects and the way that we manage them. Um, we aren't great at building in flexibility to things because we like locking them in. You know, we like laws that are really firm, that really commit us to things. And sometimes what we actually need is just a little bit of wiggle room to respond to information as it comes in. These areas of tipping points are uh, some of the most profound in terms of thinking about how we grapple with uncertainties, as Muki's describing. And sea level rise from ice sheet collapse over centuries is an incredibly important one. But we also see tipping points uh, playing out at even smaller scales. So that coral reef example, those are shifts to alternate stable states that can be really hard to get back. But also ecosystems at bigger scales are vulnerable, whether it's the Amazon potentially flipping to a state where it's more like a savanna-like ecosystem where tons of carbon could be lost from those forest lands or the boreal forests in the Arctic where you tend to get a feedback effect as well. Maybe just emphasize that tipping points are one way of thinking about uh, what we definitely want to avoid, but where we certainly don't know exactly where those thresholds can be. But from a long-term perspective, feedbacks can also be really important, even if they're not necessarily associated with those direct thresholds. So for example, as the permafrost melts, in the Arctic, it releases carbon dioxide, methane, and that exacerbates the amount of climate change that occurs. So when we think about trajectories into the future, there may be some trajectories where we make the problem a lot harder to solve if some of these feedbacks really kick into gear. Um, can you, a uh, couple of questions here about the Arctic, um, how research and the international community is cooperating um, on Arctic issues and um, um, when uh, um, this question, when a majority of our international trade occurs on our oceans, wouldn't our melting ice caps create new trade routes? How do we get big business to become involved if, if they see opportunities in, in actually um, in climate change opening up those routes? So the Arctic is a system where there's sea ice that's been melting in some cases a lot more rapidly than we had predicted. And indeed, we now have areas where shipping routes are opening up anew and also places to drill for more oil are opening up anew. There's a lot of international cooperation that happens around the Arctic. All of the nations that ring the Arctic are at the table in those discussions. And again, it's figuring out not just at the local scale or the national scale, but now at the international scale, how do we put into place new governance systems that are really having to react in real time to circumstances that we haven't ever grappled with before. So here's another one we've never grappled with before. Will large-scale geoengineering um, be useful um, or likely in the near future? OK, so geoengineering brings together a whole bunch of things into one term. I think let's split them out because it's uh, really important not to conflate them. So first of all, you've got things that are called carbon dioxide removal, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. A tree, uh, if you plant a tree, that technically is carbon dioxide removal. So there are ways to use the land to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that are all about win-wins and ecosystem stewardship, things that make sense no matter what, even though that carbon is vulnerable to loss if we head into high climate change scenarios. That carbon dioxide removal space also can involve using bioenergy crops and then burning them up to generate electricity, capturing that CO2 and injecting it underground. and there are new plants opening that are uh, direct air capture. There is a really cute picture in the newspaper today of this little tiny plant that uh, ideally will save the planet, but it's only at a prototype stage where it is pulling CO2 straight out of the atmosphere and directing it underground through engineered chemical capture. On the other side of the geoengineering spectrum, there is solar radiation management, so basically making the atmosphere more reflective in a bunch of different ways. So this can be somewhat cheap, although it's hard to imagine that you wouldn't really cause a ruckus at the global scale in terms of international governance if one country started to put uh, sulfate particles into the atmosphere to control the thermostat. And a really key aspect there is that we may be able to dial the planet's temperature to where we want it or the temperature's precipitation patterns to where they want them. But it is incredibly hard through that solar radiation management to get all of those aspects of climate back to where we used to be. Um, so this is a question about inter international cooperation. What are the chances that there will be international cooperation on adaptation? Um, I think probably this applies across the board. Um, what are the chances that the international community, whether it's geoengineering or mitigation reducing emissions, um, that, that, those, that the international cooperation will be what 
um, saves the day in the end, in particular on, on adaptation as well. I think, I think there's um, a lot of really positive direction um, in terms of international cooperation on adaptation. So, of course, you have, uh, you have one model, which is uh, developed countries providing funding for adaptation products or projects in developing countries. But you also have um, a big, there's a huge market out there for people who come up with new ideas to deal with heat waves, to deal with floods, to deal with wildfires. Um, China is coming up with incredible like floating island type technology, um, which you can imagine there would be huge demand for at some point in the future. And uh, those are actually like arguably market driven, not even international cooperation in that sense. I think where we um, run into a lot more trouble in terms of international cooperation and adaptation is thinking about the flow of people from one place to another. Um, and displacement is a huge concern, uh, exacerbating migration, exacerbating conflict, which then drives to migration. Both of those are huge concerns. And um, we, we don't have a system, uh, for instance, of designating someone a climate refugee. Right? We don't know what that is um, or whether even it would be beneficial. So I think in terms of deploying solutions um, that take place in a single town, in a single country, I think uh, international cooperation will flow quite naturally. But when it comes to moving people and drivers that really push countries into conflict with one another, um, it's going to take a little bit more creativity. On the mitigation side, you might say that the most important role of international cooperation is not to save the day all by itself, but to be an important enabling signal of where the world is going that starts to get the reverberations going that really need to happen in terms of distributed action and leadership. So for example, there are a lot of aspects of reining in our emissions of heat trapping gases that get real easy once the costs of clean energy are competitive. And if the Paris Agreement is a success, in many ways you could say, what it may be doing most of all is providing a signal that that is where the world is heading in a way that enables investments to channel that innovation all the way through that very long research development deployment pipeline that it takes to scale these types of solutions. And that similarly reverberates from international down to the national scale to the local scale and back up again. So next question, in the current political climate, what are the chances that the US will in fact adapt? Uh, where do we get the political will? Fortunately, a lot of adaptation is driven by local and state governments. And um, if they can find the money, I am very, I feel confident that cities um, understand what the risks are and understand how much benefit they will get from um, take going the extra mile on, on resilience. I think what we're missing um, in the current political climate is the long lever of the federal government. So for example, um, right near the end of the Obama administration, there is an executive order on the, the, it was called the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. And it said if you're investing federal dollars in, a, in infrastructure that is in a floodplain, you have to build it one foot higher than you would have had to before, recognizing that climate change is going to make floods more severe and we don't want to have to rebuild that again. So let's just put in that one foot buffer. And if it's really critical infrastructure, like a hospital, I think it was two feet. And um, that's a really powerful lever because federal dollars are being spent everywhere, in every town in America. And that executive order has been rescinded. So I think to the extent that we can give control, like decentralize control to the local and, and state level, um, the benefits are there, the, the vulnerabilities are known, um, but we're certainly missing opportunities to kind of push things out at large scale with the leadership of the federal government. Um, let's see. So this question, why is it that developed societies take more economic damage? Uh, I'm assuming this means um, as we have more coastal development, more infrastructure development in, in developed countries, that that, that more damages occur there. Um, how do we how do we um, think about that issue? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, when we tally up the damage from a disaster, we like count the number of buildings um, that were damaged by it, and we maybe say this one was not totally damaged, but it was fifty percent damaged. 
the structure was worth $200,000, so that's $100,000 in damage. When you go to a developing country, there aren't as many structures that are worth $200,000. And so even if you have thousands more buildings that are affected, um, when you add up the economic value of all of those things, you get to a much smaller number. Um, and I, that's actually been a really tricky thing in terms of trying to say who gets hit worst by climate change. Because if you count it in terms of dollars, um, you know, think about the houses uh, in Napa that are probably worth a lot more than houses in Puerto Rico that um, got hit recently. And that's not certainly not a fair metric to say one is worse than the other. Um, but that's sort of the quandary that we're in. And I think that's why it's important, as Catherine started with, is that we, we also have lives and welfare on the one hand. We have dollars on the other. And we can't just focus on one of those. And if you take those dollars as a fraction of a country's GDP, the picture can look really different. So are you both hopeful about um, what the U.S. will do? Um, and in particular, in thinking about investment in science um, and research, um, especially when many Americans see the current administration attacking and undermining scientific research. So as climate change scientists, I think one of our daily tasks is just reading the news of what's happened in the last 24 hours in terms of climate policy. And I've decided that I need to install like one of those treadmill desks so I can read the news at a sprinting pace. Uh, in that there is a profound unwinding that's been happening. And I think, how do we grapple with that? How do we think about what's at risk and how we can still make sure momentum stays the course? I think the most hopeful thing is really what we've been emphasizing again and again in this conversation is that leadership on the climate issue is strongly distributed. So it's not just a question of, uh, as our executive order called preparing the, the US for the impacts of climate change is revoked, not is the US no longer preparing for the uh, impacts of climate change, but where is that happening now and what ways can that be intensified? So for example, there's a report, Kate, that you worked on that mm -hmm. basically says that 25 states are likely to exceed what would happen under the Clean Power Plan, even if the Clean Power Plan is revoked. As Governor Brown has been doing, along with governors from Washington and New York, the real question is on both mitigation and adaptation, how can we crank up that action? How can we make sure the private sector is engaged such that even though we've had this unwinding happening at the national scale, momentum stays the course? The one uh, positive tidbit I'll add that I thought of recently was um, in the lawsuits that have been filed against the major oil and gas companies, mostly by uh, municipalities in California, um, I looked at the, the basis for their um, lawsuit, and it had fantastic science in it. Um, the citations were all there. Uh, they had a really, it was really well written in terms of what we know about emissions, uh, what we know about the oil and gas company's role in that, and how that's leading to sea level rise that uh, counties in California are spending money to address. Um, so I guess, if nothing else, my research might help someone sue an <laughs> oil and gas company one day. <laughs> well, that leads to another question, which is, what, what do you think the role of, of scientists should be during this debate? Um, there were many people that were um, critical of efforts to raise climate change as we watch the devastation in, from the hurricanes over the summer, um, um, statements that this is not the time to talk about climate change. Um, scientists have been um, embattled in the past. Um, what, what do you think is the role of, of scientists in general, and what are, what are your hopes for yourselves as, as you look forward in, in, in terms of building the political will to do some of the activities that you think are important? As a scientist, I strongly believe that knowledge should be available. There should be access to it. It should be something that can be shared and uh, a basis of empowerment for Americans. And I think many of the more epic questions, even that tie to your previous question around what happens when data on what the climate is doing become less able to be accessed or are no longer being collected, those types of questions are incredibly important. 
I think as scientists, we have a lot of personal choices in terms of where we orient on that spectrum of options. I worked for the IPCC for a very long time, and all IPCC authors have tattooed on their eyeballs policy relevant but policy neutral. And I guess this question of policy neutrality, now that I no longer have that tattooed on my eyeballs, becomes more pressing. How do you think about where you say, here's how evidence matters, and here's how it becomes actionable and influential? I've personally thought a lot about the role of assessment, where you're bringing scientists together to figure out the state of knowledge on issues relevant to societies, and you recognize that to understand what the relevant questions are, you have to have society in conversation with experts. So I think we shouldn't say scientists are over here in a little silo on a university campus putting out their papers that no one will ever read. It really should be, how are they talking with the people who are suing the law, uh, oil companies? Maybe that's a little bit more politicized than what we would normally do. But how do you make sure that science resonates for society and something that matters to everyone and where people see their entry points in knowledge and facts and where facts hit up against values? I think as, as someone who has only recently become part of the academic science endeavor, um, I've been really struck by uh, both how, how committed scientists have to be to do what they're doing. Um, being a scientist, especially in academia, is like everyone shooting errors at you in all different directions. You know, nobody wants you to be right, they wanna be right. And so it's hard to put out a single paper um, and it's hard to shift the scientific consensus from you know, a base understanding that we couldn't possibly do anything to a climate to now virtually every single scientist saying we have proof that we are changing the climate. I think that's an incredibly, it's unbelievable that, that that's been accomplished. Um, having said that, I think perhaps we were a little bit spoiled in terms of assuming that people would listen to us. <laughs> and so I think there's been a wake up call and I've certainly seen that at Stanford um, of a little bit more emphasis on science communication and really focusing on making sure that science resonates with society um, because that's not part of what we're taught, but it really needs to be. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, on behalf of World Affairs, I want to ask you to uh, welcome, uh, join me in, in thanking Miyuki Hino and Catherine Mock for a great discussion tonight. Thank you.